So I wanted to thank everybody for responding to the first episode I tried to do about answering coffee questions in five minutes. And we just have so many great questions that I'm struggling a bit and I'm actually trying to do research on some of these. Some of them um, are, are a little tough to, to, to do five minutes on. Some of them are impossible, like uh, uh, was the 65 uh, Kecksburg incident a UFO cover-up or just a satellite crash as is maintained by the Air Force? Don't, don't make me go there. And then uh, Fried Chicken Yes asked, uh, what is the best kind of dog? And I replied already, your dog is the best kind of dog. Um, I got a, a real, real like, this is a real question. In all seriousness, what is with the worldwide shortage of Chemex filters? And it's totally true. It's just like the uh, terracotta clay pots at Home Depot or Lowe's. There are no terracotta pots in my area. And Chemex is like that. Their supply chain is just um, broken temporarily. Um, but I do hear some of the really big, you know, online retailers have some. Um, so let's get to some questions. And I have to call out questions that I really can answer in five minutes. And ones I'm, I'm prepared for and did a little work for. And um, so here we go. Question number one for today is um, very difficult. Thanks. Uh, when I, um, Jack, when I first got into good coffee, I noticed many Ethiopian African coffees have a strong and well-defined blueberry note, uh, which I have not seen in a while. Is that a seasonal thing? I've tried several African dry process and well, um, good. They don't hit me with that same flavor that got me into good coffee. Do coffees just have, have a different character from year to year? And in looking for that same blueberry uh, note, am I just chasing nostalgia? And uh, this was great. And it was super funny because someone online jumped in and gave all these answers, which was really actually kind of weird. So, oh, I'm going to try to answer the question really fast. Blueberry note in coffee. We used to get that a lot in Harar. We used to describe that a lot in Harar. We also got that in um, some of the early high-level Yurgachefes. There was one called Misty Valley from an exporter named Begersh, Abdullah Begersh, um, that people would find that blueberry note in. I think it could have been um, this thing about nostalgia, like the first impression you have is so outstanding because it's so remarkably different. You hear the word blueberry described like dried blueberry, and it really strikes you, you know, um, and, and it, it did for me too. And so I think there was a kind of a, a, a social effect there and a historical effect of experiencing that for the first time. The first Harars that came with really strong blueberry were from um, Muhammad Oxide. And uh, this was, ta we're talking 20 years ago now. And they, um, they were, what was distinct about these is they were very fresh. They were coming very early in the season from, from Harar tends to be a little bit earlier in the crop cycle in Ethiopia. And these were getting pushed out and exported really fast. And I think the coffees were arriving so fast that in relation to other Ethiopia dry processes at that, at that time, which would be like um, a lot of them commercial quality, like Jima grade five. Jima five was everywhere. It was always old and it tasted woody. And that was um, what some people defined as mocha flavor in coffee. And people really prize this, this, this aspect in natural Ethiopians, but it's kind of the flavor of coffee being old and woody. So I think part of it was we were getting these really fresh Harars for the first time, and it was really impressive. Um, at the same time, I remember very distinctly that two, three, four months into selling those coffees, we weren't getting the blueberry it really wasn't the same as just the first roast that came out from that. So um, is a transitory quality like that in a coffee real? Yes, but if it, if it can't last, um, we're talking about something more um, about processing and timing and logistics, and it's not really like from the cultivar, from, um, you know, it's, 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 it's there and it's not there. So I'm gonna stop right there with that. Um, 
I really like the fact that you brought up nostalgia. I think it's really important. There's an old uh, coffee roaster in the U.S. where I traveled with him a few times, and every time we'd go somewhere, I'd be like, this Sumatra isn't like it was 20 years ago. You know, that was when they, and it was always about something in the past that was really great. And um, the problem is, especially with sensory things, you can't save a sample of that and actually put it um, right next to the current sample. And you might find like, oh, I actually, that was just impressive to me because it was the first time I tasted it, like this Harar. Um, I call this in, in backpacking, which I never do, but <laughs> a few times, the craft macaroni and cheese effect. If you know the boxed craft macaroni and cheese, and it's, you take that backpacking and it's unbelievable. And you say to yourself, why am I not eating this all the time? This is amazing food. And you go home and cook it. And you're like, this is salty. This is terrible. <laughs> like, so there's that effect of context, et cetera. Um, I, I want to say we do get different forms of berry. And you, you also mentioned Kenya um, or East Africa, especially Kenya. We get... Um, black currant and blackberry and um, some form of blueberry there that's more like a syrup or jam. The, I think the Kenyas can have a more jammy effect. They're washed coffees, high acidity, so they come off really different than a natural that has berry. I'll also say that this year we've had naturals that have berry, um, a very nice berry. Um, we had one from Hambela, which is a great region next to Kercha in southern Ethiopia coffee that used to all get smuggled out and transported, let's just say, over and be sold as Yerga Chefe. And what's happening now is, is Yerga Chefe, I believe maybe we're finding less quality in Yerga, things called Yerga Chefe because all the regions that were supplying coffee to Yerga Chefe to sell as Yerga Chefe, because it had a, a name, are selling individually. So the Guji Shakiso coffees, Uraga, and from, from this uh, near side of Shakiso, are really incredible. And so many things to look forward to, even if we don't find that blueberry, not sure if it's imagination or not, but okay. Okay, so my next question is gonna take a while to read. So as I said, I don't have to start my timer till I, till I start answering, because it's not like five minute question and answer, it's just five minute answer. Okay, so this takes a while because it's a really complete question. Um, variegated snippets, great name. Um, is, is blooming blooming a real and necessary step for pour over and other similar techniques? It uh, may be necessary, but the reason usually offered seems bogus. Ostensibly, it is to let the carbon dioxide, CO2, escape. But what CO2 uh, needed to escape would have escaped after roasting and grinding. And even if there is some left, the solubility of CO2 in hot water is low. So it would evolve uh, anyway as the coffee is brewed. Didn't quite get that. The more plausible reason to wait uh, after the first little shot of water, like pre-infusion, hits the coffee is perhaps to wet the grounds evenly by letting capillary forces spread across the water and the pile of, of grounds and form a uniform wet mass instead of dry and wet particles and to not let leakage paths develop for the water to flow through without much extraction, um, like channeling in espresso, but channeling happens like in pour over too. Could you clear up this confusion? Thanks. And the short answer is no, I can't, <laughs> but I'm going to try. Okay, and then there's a related question. Pick Tour Food asked, um, any difference in resting period uh, for beans roasted using a popper versus a drum like a Be More versus a commercial roaster? From my experience with beans from local roasters, they tend to taste better about um, a week post-roast and stay pretty stable for another three weeks. Okay, so the question is about degassing and one aspect is, is for freshness, um, degassing uh, during, uh, with different roast methods. 
And the other question is about um, degassing and the effect on brewing and brewing technique and what's sort of mythical and what's not. Okay, so the first thing is there is a lot of degassing, especially carbon dioxide that's uh, coming off of coffee. And interestingly, people talk about it after roasting and there needs to be this resting period because of this degassing. However, it actually, a lot of degassing happens during roasting. And to the, to the second uh, person asking about the roasting process, the very interesting thing is that air roasting and the way coffee expands in air roasting, air, uh, air roasting puffs up coffee. If you roast in a popper and a, and a be more or another slower drum process, commercial probat type roaster, and you put them side by side and they're the exact same degree of roast. You grind them, you do a color test, everything. You taste them, same degree of roast. You will have a larger bean in the air, air roast. It will have puffed up more, it will have expanded more. And a lot of that is just the way moisture is liberated in the coffee and the, the way the thermal transfer is so different in air roasting and high velocity air stream versus a drum roasting, which is, is air roasting. Drum roasting is a convective roasting process by and large. It's not conducting to the, to the drum, but the, what you find is that there's a lot more degassing that happens during roasting of an air roast versus a drum roast. Okay, so I've seen that very empirically. I can take two roasts that are the same age, air roast and let's say probat roast, because that seems to be the most, or the bullet, the Alio bullet uh, roaster actually tends to do this too. And you brew a French press with the same amount of water and you'll see this huge amount of foaming, blooming of the grounds in the French press um, from the probat roast because there's still so much residual CO2 emitting from the coffee versus the air roast, which has degassed more already, but is still continuing to degas. Um, and I'm gonna overlay some photos here because I'm gonna, I, I was trying to do that this morning with some different freshness of roast and pouring the water just to see the crust that forms on the top of the coffee, which is showing you uh, to some degree um, since I, I don't have anything to measure actually outgassing. Um, so what you're observing from a local roaster that this probat roast tends to be fresher, um, tends to maybe need a little longer till it hits, hits its peak and to it lasts a little longer. Actually, I think that's, that's, that's quite true. Um, the great thing about home roasting is you're just roasting fresh all the time and we get really used to having incredibly fresh coffee. So, our standard kind of shifts a lot with home roasting. Um, but I would agree. And now to really get to this, this brewing question, I think you're, I think you're right. I think you're, you're, I think that we can't, when the coffee's fresh, like one to two days, or let's say you, you have a coffee emergency and you, you roast it and you have to brew it right away. Um, you will definitely see your CO2 preventing uh, the, um, water acting as a good solvent of the, the coffee. Um, you, and like I said, you can just see it in a very fresh pr French press. And not only do you see the huge layer of foam, you will see this incredibly uh, vivid action of the, the, the gas coming off the foam when you, when you pour that. It's pretty remarkable. Um, and um, I totally agree with you in terms of the importance of saturation and, and channeling. And I've, I've gone to actually doing a lot of stirring in my pour over. Um, the big question too, that I just, it's always on my mind, is all these things can be true. All these things can be technically, people can argue in forums and all this stuff. And you're like, yeah, that's true, that's true. How true is it? Like, not how true, but how big of an impact does it have on your result, that you, the result you care about? Not, you don't care how much foam there is in your drink. You care if it, if it tastes good and if you're getting good extraction. So the result is good that you notice it. And so these minor, minor things in coffee can be true. And I think you're getting at this here. This may be true with CO2, but it's a nit to pick. And if you're ignoring some other, out of time. Okay. Okay, so this next question, I am actually, for the first time, doing a take two. I feel like I, I shouldn't let myself do this because this is, 
This is the challenge. Five minutes. I've got to get to the answer. But I did such a bad job that I'm, I'm doing take two. Okay, first time. This is the hard one for me because I did some research on it. So Sadie Maybounce wrote, is Sumatran coffee still leading to loss of tiger habitat? Or can I start drinking it again? Cause it's my favorite. Um, you can start drinking again, but um, let, me, let me tell you what I found. So, um, so I wanna give you the short answer cause this is what I'm trying to do. Answer the question then pontificate. Um, Lintong, Lake Toba. It's an area, it's called North Sumatra. Um, it's kind of north central. Um, lake Toba is very well known. Lintong is, is the south part of that lake. There's other areas around it, including like uh, Sidi Kalong. I can, um, I'll put up a little list and a little map of that area. Um, the reason that that area would not lead to any um, uh, environmental impact in terms of deforestation is because um, it's an old area. It's the Batak people um, generally in that area. And um, they have cultivated there for millennia. And um, uh, the land is all used. It's not native forest anymore. So there's no forest loss to occur. Um, and that area, it's, it's very stable in terms of coffee and there's good environmental practices. You know, coffee is, is generally grown in shade there and it's not just like, you know, you don't see smallholder coffee farming in Sumatra generally that has just like taken a whole hillside, stripped it and planted coffee. So that's what I wanted to get to is the real issues in deforestation in Sumatra and in a lot of other places is large scale um, plantation type uh, systems um, where investors have come in, taken huge swaths of land, gotten access to them, whatever they've done, and planted, for example, in Sumatra, palm oil. So if you if you look at the maps, and I'll pull up some maps so you, maps so you can see them, you're going to see lowland areas that are not coffee areas that are really have shifted use and been deforested in the last um, over the last 20 years, and a lot of those are are in palm oil. And um, I think most of us know the issues with palm oil, how it was sold as this incredible environmental, <laughs> it's gonna be this amazing product. We're gonna grow oil from trees and it's gonna be green and it's turned into a, quite a disaster. Um, so I think you probably wanna know like my specific experience, not like what you can find on websites. Coffee areas I don't see deforestation um, largely in Sumatra and other places. I don't see it because coffee is generally grown a bit more harmoniously than other products, um, especially low-lying um, products where they clear out the whole land and they replant in a, in a, in a, in a mono, monocrop, monocultural way. Coffee's oftentimes mixed, especially in Sumatra. People are growing peppers they're growing vegetables for the market and then they're growing coffee. And it's generally has some shading on it. So uh, it never looks um, like anyone's gone in and ripped out everything and put in coffee. Um, the, are some, there are some areas that I've been to, um, one called Gaia Lewis, where I saw a lot of like extension of road building. And as soon as you, soon as you extend the roads, um, my, dish, my dishes are done. Uh, as soon as you extend the roads, the, ro the main major trees along the roads get logged and things get planted. And the, the real culprit I saw on my trip to Gaia Lewis, and, and deforestation was really on my mind, I was, felt like I was really seeing it in a way I don't always see it, was um, lemongrass. Lemongrass was being planted and it was also being planted in a way that it was on high slopes, which looked like uh, without regard for, um, for uh, soil loss. And those are crops that are really bad. I see a lot of that onions uh, being planted in, in Central America um, and potatoes and things that are being planted with that are gonna lead to um, soil erosion very quickly. So coffee's not really, not really one of those things. Um, I also wanted to bring up a really complicated thing and I don't mean to, <clears throat> uh, 
question your 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 interest here at all. Um, is that is that there's other things that are really important. One is orangutans are also really important in Sumatra. The other is people. Um, there was the environment was protected protected in Gayo in the Acha area where the forests are because there was a civil war, and people that were forced off land and they couldn't farm because they were terrorized. So some of the farming that I think we're seeing coming back to the areas is because people are safe again. So I, I can't be against that. Um, but we, you definitely do need, and there is um, programs in Sumatra for protection because this is a really important tiger species. I think it's the smallest, the smallest one. And um, I hope you answered that. Let's go out. Hey, so my fourth question, I think is really good. And I actually recognize this name from Instagram and like someone that comments a lot and is sort of involved. Um, so they've definitely been around a long time and um, active in our little home roasting community. So Forest Bather asks, I've been roasting your beans exclusively for 14 years. It's a long time. I never feel comfortable with determining full city or full city plus. I've used your pictures, but it's so different when actually doing it. After blowing through two roasters, I now just do an air popper, popcorn popper. I take my beans out at the end of first crack. Otherwise, a bunch of beans haven't gone through a crack. Um, and I was under the impression that they needed to crack in order to be optimal. Is it okay to have some uncracked? Seems like a newbie question for someone who's done this for so dang long. I really can't believe I haven't figured this out yet. I can, I can believe you haven't figured it out because it's actually really hard and everybody is just left with these questions um, about it. So the first thing I would just point out to answer this is that air roasting is very fast. And you really do, um, you really are stopping a roast. I've, you know, got to the point where I'm stopping a roast in first crack in order to get a light roast, presuming that it goes enough into it to avoid the bready flavors and such. And so you should know if coffee hasn't gone through first crack because you're just going to be getting a lot of dry bread grain flavors, like kind of malto meal. You think of a lot of breakfast cereals, um, uh, oat, oaty, oat, oat like flavors like Cheerios. Um, those are flavors associated with light roast. And I don't hate them, but they're not, you know, entirely coffee flavors um, traditionally. So um, the first thing to know is do you like the coffee you're getting? And, and, and go away from, you know, the idea of am I doing it right? Am I doing it wrong? Am I getting it to a city or full city? Um, if you do stop it, kind of well first crack is still going on a bit you're probably not getting to full city full city plus that requires a little bit more but things can happen so fast in a popper it's just all condensed um because there's other roasters where you really to get to that same level you're going to be really waiting hearing first crack stop fully waiting a minute and then it's like okay here i am at city plus let's say so, so some of these some of these roast methods that we're you know, uh, improvising here are, are more challenging. And I've just been using an air fryer a lot. It's a, basically a convective toaster oven and roasting coffee. And I just put up a bunch of video and material about that. And that gives you a good minute of like first crack has stopped. And it's really cool too, because the coffee doesn't move. You're just sitting there watching this statically, shaking it a little, and you can see first crack popping and stuff. It's really fun. And then it gives you a really good pause to, to, to sort of evaluate when you want to stop it. So you're just, it's challenging with a fast air roaster like this. Um, the other thing I would say is that like in co coffee is this, you know, we treat it just as this thing you do. And if I, you know, like baristas, it's like it's, if it's 18 grams and it's 22 seconds and they they have this very mechanical mindset towards something that's really like an agriculture product and there there is not that kind of consistency in something so it's not like the you know you, you the farm has worked and the whole process before you export coffee is to homogenize it 
into something that behaves similarly in the roaster. You know, you don't want some coffee all light and not roasting and some dark. However, it's, it's just an agricultural product, it's a seed. So there is difference and there's difference, you know, even in, in pour over brewing. I mean, all of that coffee is not having that dwell time with all of that water. You know, some of that coffee is just dribbling right through. No matter what your technique, you have, you have a blend of coffee from the first stuff you pour to the last stuff you pour. It's a blend. It's a mix of different coffee that's infused differently under different situations. And I think you can say that for roasting. So I think it's a fault of us to talk about it so mechanically. Like I roasted this batch to 12 minutes and 18 seconds and it was this and you know, you can measure these things, but it's like, it's kind of imperfect. So we, you know, we target these, these, these roast methods, which are also very imperfect. And let me do a quick, quick explanation of what's full city, what's city plus, what's, you know, well, they're an alternative to saying medium, because if I said I roast my coffee medium, you'd have no idea what I was saying. It's an old trade term, supposedly based in New York, because roasters in New York were consistently roasting to a certain level that they started to call city roast for the city, people in New York roasting, you know, commercial roasters. And then someone would define themselves, oh yeah, but I roast city plus, you know, I, we're outside of New York, <laughs> I'm not in New York, but they could use that as a benchmark. I guess it was so consistent, uh, the style of roasting in New York City, that you could say that's city. And then someone else could say, well, I roast city plus. And someone would say, well, we roast full city here. And full city was like Alfred Pete, uh, you know, in Seattle and in California, uh, it was supposedly, you know, the full city plus roast. And now I think, I think we call that French pretty much. It's, it's quite dark. So none of us know what we're talking about. That's the answer. <laughs> okay. Today, I think I drank too much coffee, but I'm going to do like the bonus round. This is going to be the five minute answers where I try to answer all the other questions in five minutes. <laughs> and some of these are really good questions. They really deserve a lot more than this, but I, I'm not qualified in, in some cases, or I just, I don't know how much, I don't know what to say. Cause I, I just like, don't have the, I don't know. <laughs> so, um, this is going to be my five minute bonus rounds. I'm going to try to answer every other question that we got. Um, first question. Chomp Chomp 42, do you ever dabble in Liberica or Eugenoides? Is there a, even a market for these oddities? So those are two different coffee species. We're outside of the family of Arabica there. Eugenoides, I don't even know if I'm saying that right, um, is the um, one of the parents of Arabica coffee. The parents were uh, a Eugenoides and a Canifora Robusta coffee got together and they formed Arabica. Um, Liberica is a, a different thing. Um, there's other ones like Excelsa, which are these sort of strange, large bean, very tree-like uh, co coffee plants. We've sold Liberica. We had Liberica from India. It's very popular in the Philippines. Um, I've, I've cupped a lot of Liberica. Somebody from the Philippines was kind enough to send me a sample of Liberica that was really carefully done, really carefully picked carefully processed everything like ripe cherry everything dead on it was terrible i mean it was really bad and and i'm i know there's people out there who are gonna rally around liberica but man that stuff is rough and um if you don't like pure robusta which I actually do i like a lot of robusta and a lot of people can't stand it but i i it's very bitter but really good robusta has a there's something to it. I mean, I, I really enjoy it. And I like that. So these people who wouldn't like that are never going to like Liberica. It's salty. It's minerally. It's terrible. Eugenoides, I have seen that there's a farm, I think, in Colombia producing it. And I believe Onyx, uh, the roaster, had a batch of it. Um, it's... Uh, I don't know much about the cup. I, I have, I actually have some plants growing in my collection from seeds I've collected. It's cool. Um, I don't know much about the flavor. 
I thought it was low caffeine. I, I read recently it's actually high caffeine. It's actually higher caffeine than Arabica. So I can't can't tell you much about Eugenoise. It'd be fun to taste it. But, you know, my experience, some of these are uh, other species of coffee are, are really, really rough. Um, and, uh, you know, it's like uh, I was just very picking and my friend, we found huckleberries and, but it, it was mixed in with this other bush and I ate the other bush and it was like, blah, you know, I'm gonna like get totally sick, super bitter. That's like some of these coffees. I mean, they're, they're not fun. Okay. Um, I've been roasting in a West Bend property too since 1997. I've been cooling my beans in the same wire collector for the whole time. And my wife says it's nasty. I'm looking for a good affordable sieve sieve um, for sifting the chaff and cooling the beans. Any suggestions? I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> you can you can use um, the stuff called PBR, um, brew, coffee, brew, uh, beer brewers use it. Such great stuff. It's kind of like OxyClean. It's an oxygen type cleaner. Um, sodium percarbonate is the name. That, that cleans everything. Um, and it's really not that, as far as I know, it's not that uh, contaminating or anything. It's actually pretty benign. So um, I don't know. I like the colanders that are wire mesh because they have some kind of like, not, not like spaghetti colanders with holes, but they're sort of a wire mesh bowl because they have some texture to them. You can kind of like rough up the coffee um, to get the chaff off. So uh, you're kind of, yeah, I hope you find a colander. <laughs> um, what is the diagnosis for a flat tasting roast from a preheated beamor? The roasted beans look uniform and all completed first crack and beyond, but the cup profile has no real depth or sweetness. Um, this is a really good question and it really deserves a better answer than I'm gonna give. So um, push the roast, try to try, cut you down your batch size, get the roast to go faster. Beamors are, are already very slow and very even and that's great and preheating helps but I would cut down your batch size and try to push that roast to go faster. The thing is, is that when you have a longer roast, you can roast to the same color and uh, two different roasts, short, shorter and longer in the same roaster. Grind the coffee of each roast, look at the beans and the ground, look at the beans and the ground, like put them all out and you'll see that the, the color difference between the longer roast is less than the shorter roast. So you'd say, oh, it's more even. It's evenly roasted from inside to out. True, and that works pretty good for espresso and that tastes really flat as a brewed coffee. You lose acidity, you lose dimension. It's very flat tasting. So I think that's what your is going on. Roast faster. Okay, thank you very much.